Okay, so welcome to our weekly IFAM seminar. Um, I'm Noreena Allen. I'm the director for the Center of Epidemiology and Population Health. And um, today we have a joint presentation by the Center for Epi and Population Health and uh, CHIP for the Center for uh, Health Information Partnerships. So we're excited today to be talking about bias in the reuse of electronic health data. And we have two exciting speakers that I'll introduce shortly, followed by a panel session. So I hope that uh, you will participate. Please put all your questions in the Q&A box and we will answer them at the end of the two talks. So it's really my pleasure now to present our two speakers. Um, Nicole Weisskopf is an assistant professor in the Department of Biomedical Informatics at the Oregon Health and Science University. She's gonna be starting off our talks today and she's gonna be followed by Carolyn Thompson, who's an associate professor of epidemiology at San Diego State University. Um, and we're very excited to have them present um, today to talk about us, electronic medical records. So Nicole, do you wanna go ahead and share screen? All right. Can you all see my slides? Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So I'm going to be starting us off by talking about bias in EHR data and how that impacts um, the reliability and validity of clinical quality measurement. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest to report. I did want to acknowledge that this work was funded by the National Library of Medicine. And I'm going to start off by giving a little bit of background about EHR data in general, a little bit about EHR data quality, which is where a lot of my previous research is. And then I'm going to get into this issue of bias in EHR data and the potential impact. So um, I'm not sure how familiar this audience is with EHR data, but there are tremendous benefits and challenges in the reuse of these data. So I'm talking about beyond the point of care, either in research or quality measurement, operational tasks. And the good things is that we have a tremendous breadth and depth of information. There's just a huge amount of data stored in these records. Um, the data reflect real patients who are receiving real health care. And in a lot of ways, they're much more representative of the people that we want to learn more about and take better care of than participants in traditional prospective research. And this really provides us with a unique opportunity to assess and improve health care. But there are a lot of challenges with these data as well. So for one thing, these data are collected for billing and patient care. They're not collected specifically for research or for quality improvement. Um, there's also the fact that these data are tremendously complex. I'm going to give a few simple examples. There are a lot of data quality problems. And also, it's really difficult, as it is with all retrospective research, to establish any kind of causality. It's a very complicated problem. And I included a citation at the bottom of this slide that uh, offers a really nice overview of some of these challenges. So this is uh, the American College of Cardiology risk estim estimator for um, ASCVD. This is one of the most commonly used tools in um, clinical care, especially in primary care. Um, and I'm going to be using this a little bit as a use case throughout this talk. So I wanted to show you what it looks like on the website. You can go to this link and actually enter in these values for yourself. And if you fall within the target population, this will give you an estimated 10-year risk of your chances of having cardiovascular disease or a cardiovascular event. And you can see that this includes some pretty basic demographic information and some pretty basic clinical information, a couple of labs, vitals, um, and some basic diagnoses. So if we were looking at this tool and using it prospectively, either in research or at the point of care, it would be pretty straightforward to collect and enter a lot of this information. And a lot of people who work in traditional research are used to seeing data formatted like this, which is kind of a standard flat file. Um, where you have these different variables or features of interest, and then each record corresponds to a single row. Um, and then the concepts are filled in accordingly. In clinical data reuse, this is more complicated. So let's look at this concept of diabetes. 
which sounds kind of straightforward, either you have it or you don't. But if we wanted to determine this based on EHR data, where would we even find that information? For one thing, there can be explicit mentions of this diagnosis, either in the encounter diagnoses, um, except those are only recorded if it's relevant to a given appointment. So if someone comes in for an entirely different reason for you know, a dermatology problem, they're not gonna mention the diabetes most of the time in the encounter diagnoses. Might be in the problem list, but that's not always complete. It could be in the notes, the narrative text. Actually, this is where we find a tremendous amount of information, but it's really difficult to extract that in an automated way. Or it might be in what's often called the other media. So these might be scanned referral letters um, or other kinds of summaries of health status. And that's even more challenging to extract because often these are PDFs. There are also proxy concepts that we can use. So for example, lab results might indicate that somebody has diabetes or they might be on insulin. They might have procedures that are often associated with having diabetes. And all of those can be really useful but using them requires a lot of validation to demonstrate that they're reliable proxies for this information. There's also the fact that data are stored in the EHR in a very complicated way, and I don't wanna get into this in too much depth, um, but the thing that I want you to uh, understand is that most concepts in the EHR, medications, diagnoses, procedures, labs, they're not dichotomous, which means there is not going to be a single field that's labeled as yes, they have it or no, they don't. Um, instead, we're going to have um, a whole set of tables. There's a tremendous number of tables. And each entry, um, if it is relevant for a patient, gets its own row in that table. So why does this matter? It matters because it means that with EHR data, the absence of a concept does not mean negation, even though it's often taken to imply negation. So if we want to know if a patient has diabetes or not, if it's present, we can generally trust that the patient does have diabetes if it's absent. There's a decent chance that they don't have diabetes, but we don't know that for sure. It might just not have been recorded. So this is a figure from a recent paper um, by Wang and Wright, and this is just summarizing the completeness of a number of common diagnoses in the problem list to give you an example of kind of the scope of this issue. And you can see there's a real range of completeness depending upon the diagnosis of interest. I do wanna note that it's not just the blue part, but also the orange part that indicates that they're complete. Um, but you can see that there is a range between, you know, 7% and 27% missingness for all of these concepts in the problem list. And then even if we look at something that's a bit more, you know, quote unquote, straightforward, like the concept of race or ethnicity, um, this is a, a concept where it is always recorded for a patient. Um, it's still not particularly reliable. We have really substantial data quality issues with these concepts. And um, this is actually specifically the topic of race and ethnicity is really getting a lot of attention in informatics right now because these data are so important and also so unreliable. And here you can see the sensitivity of race and ethnicity for, um, for Black patients, for example, is about 71%. It's really not very good. And this is just summarizing results from a couple of literature reviews that were looking at data quality across a number of different studies. Hogan and Wagner were two of the first to do research on this topic, and you can see correctness range from 44 to 100%. And completeness was sometimes as low as 1%, depending upon the concept of interest. Chan et al. actually looked at these different concepts and grouped them together. So for example, just for the concept of blood pressure, there was a huge range of completeness. And blood pressure is actually more reliably recorded than a lot of other concepts because it's done every time a patient presents in the clinical setting. Um, but depending upon what your needs are for that blood pressure value, it may not suit those needs. But the thing is not all data quality problems are created equal. Some of them are going to have a much more significant downstream impact depending upon your use case. And remember, we're talking about um, things like research or quality measurement. So not a single patient, but looking at an entire population in aggregate. So this is a slide that I like to use a lot. These are, they're not real data. I kind of jittered them so that they're um, 
somewhat different, but you will see this with blood pressure values in almost every EHR that you look at. Um, and what you will notice is that we have these huge spikes in counts for the tens. So 120, 140, 160, and even beyond that, you see smaller spikes for the even values as opposed to the odd values. And it's not that people's blood pressure values actually line up with these more common values in the figure, but that human beings really like to round. We like even values, we especially like multiples of 10. So by a certain definition, these blood pressure values are riddled with error. But if you're thinking about these data in the aggregate, this isn't really going to impact the mean. It's not going to skew the average value of blood pressure values in your population. For an individual patient, this could certainly matter, especially if they're you know, kind of at the cutoff for what qualifies as hypertension or not. But in aggregate, this doesn't make a big difference. Which kind of brings me um, to what my initial research goals actually were with this KO1 that I have which was trying to understand, does EHR data quality have an impact on the accuracy of EHR-based electronic clinical quality measures? And I'm not sure um, how many of you are familiar with that. So very briefly, a quality measure is when you look at a target population of interest and you have um, some kind of clinical action that you want to perform for all of those patients. So for example, um, I'm gonna be talking about a measure where all patients with ischemic vascular disease, you want them to be on aspirin. And then you calculate performance by seeing what percentage of those patients with IVD actually are on aspirin. So I wanted to know what are the kind of upstream causes of the data quality problems that matter, knowing that not all of these data quality problems are necessarily going to have a downstream impact. And then ideally, I also wanted to explore approaches to actually improving ECQM reliability, but I kind of got a little bit waylaid in some of the, um, the intricacies of this. So um, I focused on four ECQMs, which are very closely related to the ASCVD risk score tool that I showed you at the beginning. Um, these are related to cardiovascular health in primary and secondary prevention of cardiovascular problems. And uh, as I mentioned, it's aspirin for patients with ischemic vascular disease, blood pressure control for patients with hypertension, cholesterol management with statins, and smoking status assessment, and if needed, uh, cessation therapy or counseling. And as one important caveat, most of these measures are used, actually, sorry, all of these measures are applied to primary care or they're intended to be. I focus specifically on a cardiovascular population because I wanted to kind of increase my denominator and make sure that I was getting enough patients who actually qualified for these measures. So I drew from this sample of patients who had had at least one cardiovascular appointment in the previous year, and I generated three data sets for all participants, and this ended up being about 270 participants total. So um, the first data set was based on manual chart review where I had trained chart annotators actually extract out all of the concepts necessary to calculate these metrics, which align, again, very closely with the ASCVD risk score. Um, I also extracted the structured data from the EHR that align with these concepts. And those are the data that are going to be most similar to the data that in real life are being used either for quality measurement or for research because they're the easiest for us to extract out of the EHR. And then lastly, I collected patient self-report on these same concepts using a survey. And I started off just looking at the diagnoses because I was curious to see, well, how much agreement do I actually have between these three data sources? Because my original thought was that I was going to create a gold standard by combining the patient self-report and the chart review. Um, although I rapidly realized that that was going to be complicated because there's a lot of difference between these three data sets. So this is looking at just five diagnoses of interest. Um, for the structured data, I was only looking at the problem list in this example, not the encounter diagnoses. But you can see that there is a surprising amount of difference between these data sources. Um, so, you know, hypertension is notorious for being underrecorded in the structured data. But I was really surprised to see for concepts like heart failure, stroke, and heart attack, how much difference there still was. And this dark blue wedge represents self-report only. So there are a lot of patients who are saying, I have had this diagnosis or this event, 
but it's not recorded anywhere in the EHR, either in the structured data or the unstructured data. So the next thing I wanted to do is see, well, what kind of impact do we actually get on these quality measures as a result of these differences? And these are the actual performance estimates calculated for those four quality measures from each of the three data sets. And you can see that on some of them, there is a really substantial difference. So for, especially just based on the structure data, we have significantly lower performance for the aspirin for IBD measure and the cholesterol control with statin measures. Um, and both of those are reliant on medication data, which I think is important to know because the medication list is often pretty unreliable in the EHR. And then what I wanted to do was try and understand what are some of the factors that are driving these discrepancies? So I had one of my chart reviewers go back and look through the charts and try and find any possible explanation for why some of this information was different. And that's a hard thing to do. Um, but we did identify a set of potential factors. So there were factors associated with healthcare systems and utilization, like whether the patient received their primary care at OHSU or a different institution, um, factors associated with the patient, like their medical complexity, their health literacy, and lastly, factors associated with the actual clinical status of the patients. So, um, you know, was this an acute diagnosis or something historic, which happened, which was a big issue with like heart attack and stroke, things that were historic were not really recorded very reliably in the structured data, and also how well controlled was their diagnosis. So we wanted to look at this in more depth. So I had one of my chart reviewers extract a whole lot more data. I had her actually go through all of these approximately 270 charts and extract out as many of the social determinants of health highlighted by the Institute of Medicine as she could find for each patient. Um, and then what I did was I combined kind of the related concepts. There's sort of a feature selection process that had to take place because there are, you know, 20 odd concepts here. A lot of them were incomplete, so we dropped those. Um, and then we, what we ended up doing to establish correctness or lack of correctness was we combined um, the chart review and the patient self-report, and we compared that against the structured data. And we kind of used that as a proxy to say, was the structured data correct or incorrect? And then we used a mixed effects model to determine which of these social determinant type factors we had identified appeared to be associated with, with issues of data quality. And the four concepts that really fell out as being potentially associated with data quality were patient age, this issue of whether the PCP was internal to the system or external to the system, which actually aligns really nicely with some literature um, on this topic about the quality of documentation by PCPs versus specialists, sex of the patient, and also this concept of financial stress, which was kind of a composite of um, things like insurance status and actual mentions of financial stress or concern in the chart. So What's interesting here is that a lot of these factors that are actually identified as being associated with data quality are in fact factors that we want to study as being potentially associated with people's clinical outcomes. And this is really problematic because it makes it very difficult to actually study that. So let's look a little bit more closely at two of the metrics. So first, here's the blood pressure measure. And again, this is all patients with hypertension are supposed to have their blood pressure controlled to a certain threshold. So this relies on a couple of pieces of information. It relies on having a hypertension diagnosis in the structured data, and then having the blood pressure values fall below that certain level. So what if we had a hypothesis about this metric or a related question, which was that Patients with PCPs within our healthcare system and those with PCPs external to our healthcare system have different rates of hypertension. And this kind of makes sense as a hypothesis. You know, maybe people who are coming to OHSU for specialty care are more acutely sick and they have um, worse hypertension. So in most cases, we have to draw our conclusions from the EHR based on that structured data. 
It's too much work to go in and look at the unstructured data. But we know that there's measurement error in the structure diagnoses, as we've been discussing. So if that error is random with respect to the hypothesis, that doesn't matter. Again, think about that blood pressure example. It's if it's non-random data quality problems that we really have an issue. So I actually broke down the data and I looked at just the observed values. And you can see it does look like maybe we're observing a difference in the hypertension rates between patients with and without an internal PCP. But then if we look at these actual values based on the chart review and self-report, that relationship goes away. If anything, it starts looking like the opposite. And really what this seems to suggest is that the presence of the hypertension diagnosis in the structured data is what's called a collider in epidemiological research. And what happens when you condition on a collider is you might observe a spurious relationship between your dependent and independent variables. So in this case, hypertension documentation practices are associated with the independent variable of interest, which is the internal versus external PCP. And this means that associations between this variable and the documented hypertension may not reflect relationships between the variable and the actual hypertension status. So instead, what we're seeing is a trend of documentation associated with that um, that underlying variable of interest, the internal versus external PCP. Let's look at one more. So this is the aspirin for ischemic vascular disease measure. And again, um, this relies on essentially two concepts. The denominator is based on the presence of an ischemic vascular disease diagnosis. This is actually a pretty complicated diagnosis um, to capture. And then the numerator is based on whether aspirin is reported in the medication list or not. I would like to note Aspirin is usually over the counter. So this is an extra unreliable concept because it's based on someone manually entering it into the EHR rather than just being pulled directly from the order entry system. So here's our second hypothetical hypothesis. Maybe there is an association between patient financial stress and adherence to aspirin recommendations amongst patients with IBD. So again, we generally rely on the structured data for these analyses, but again, over-the-counter medications are especially prone to error. So we're hoping that this is a random error, so it doesn't have an impact on trying to answer our hypothesis. So let's look at just the observed data from the medication list. Um, and here you can see that it does look like there is maybe a bit of a relationship between financial stress and aspirin use, um, that people who report financial stress are a little bit more likely to be on aspirin within this subpopulation. But if we look at the actual data, for one thing, we see there are a lot more patients who are on aspirin, which is good, and that reflects this issue of the poor quality of the structured medication data, but also that relationship goes away again. So really it's kind of this documentation problem that we are observing more than anything else when we look at these structured data. So again, the presence of the structured data for aspirin use is a potential collider in this situation. So what initially appears to be an association between financial stress and adherence to the aspirin use guidelines is partially due to measurement error that is also associated with patient financial stress. So in conclusion, we have a number of factors, clinical and social determinants that may introduce bias into the EHR. And a lot of these are factors that we want to study as potential drivers of health, which creates a real problem. And especially with issues of health equity, this makes it really challenging to measure the phenomena of interest unless we really understand the underlying issues with the data. So a couple of open questions. Which of these findings are generalizable? Are we always going to have the same drivers of data quality problems and bias, or is it going to differ from one concept to another, from one clinical setting to another? And even if those factors are not generalizable, can we develop a generalizable approach to help us understand this problem in different situations? And lastly, are there any ways that we can use these findings to help debias our analyses that rely on EHR data? And if so, how would we do that?
So I just wanted to finish up by thanking my KO1 mentor team, my clinical advisors who helped a lot with this work, my chart annotators. And then this work was initially part of an AMIA panel, so I wanted to acknowledge the rest of the panel members. And thank you so much. Great, thanks, Nicole. Um, I'm gonna um, ask that Carolyn go ahead and start her presentation. And just if you have questions, as you have questions about the presentations, please go ahead and put them in the Q and A um, box, and we will um, have an exciting Q and A session at the end of Carolyn's presentation. Thanks. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, uh, great talk, Nicole. Thank you to Norena and Teresa for putting this together. It's really nice to be here today. I'm an epidemiologist. I'm joining you uh, from San Diego. And my talk is on population-based registry linkages to both understand and improve the validity of cancer research using electronic health records. I also have no financial interest to disclose. There are, I do have some funding and I'll acknowledge the funding at the, at the end of the presentation. Um, so today I'm going to, um, the primary purpose of the talk is to talk about the re population-based registry linkages and how we use them to better understand and improve the potential for bias in our research. I'm gonna start, however, with a little theory um, from the epidemiology literature, as well as from the causal inference literature, to um, talk a little bit more about the concepts of bias. <clears throat> so in our increasingly complex data-driven world, there are many types of bias. And you may have heard um, of these kinds of classifications, Berkson bias, colliding bias, admission bias, selection bias, uh, and they somehow seem to keep expanding. Um, uh, in epidemiology, and thanks primarily to the causal inference literature, um, we've tried to um, subsume the biases into um, sort of a simple ontology, which I'm going to go through now. So the first idea here is the idea of internal versus external validity. Um, and so we are functioning usually within an EHR population and primarily with a, within um, a study population that's nested within our EHR population. We want to know the truth, it's out there. It's in our target population, which is perhaps our catchment region, some other generalizable group of patients, um, but we're here. So there's a lot of decisions that need to be made, um, both between harvesting our study population from our EHR population, and then also understanding how our EHR population is nested within our target population. We can actually divide these two concepts here um, quite nicely. Internal validity is the idea of whether or not we can measure the truth in our study sample. So among the people we have harvested for our study, can we determine the truth of what, what we're interested in? And then external validity is, does our EHR validly estimate the truth for our target population? And one thing to point out here is that, that number one, internal validity, we need to know that we have the truth for our study population is a prerequisite for generalizing that to the target population. And so all forms of bias can um, generally be summarized into three major categories. Um, Nicole nicely went through the middle one here, which is the common effect bias. I'll start on the left, common cause bias, where we're interested in exposure X and its effect on outcome Y. And we might have a set of unmeasured or unobserved variables that are common causes of X and Y. Um, and this um, results in bias when we don't have, when we haven't measured or controlled for that C variable. Uh, it's a, we call it confounding bias. Common effect bias is, um, is it also is a, is a bias. So this is a bias that we solve by, um, um, by conditioning. Common effect bias is a, is a bias that occurs when we condition. So here we have, uh, again, exposure X and outcome Y. They share a child, S, and the bias occurs here when we select or restrict on that variable S. Um, and anytime we restrict a, a population, select from our target or from our EHR population, we're, forming, we're performing a, a, a type of restriction. So these are fairly common. And then the final 
um, example is mismeasurement, where we have not measured perfectly our X uh, exposure that we're interested in. Instead, we have some proxy for that X star, and there's a, a level of error in our X star variable. And this is generally not a problem for bias. It can result in attenuation, but it does um, uh, produce bias and, and unpredictable bias when the mis mismeasurement is differential, i.e. when it's correlated with other variables, like our outcome, for example, if the outcome we're studying also predicts the error in our exposure measurement. And so um, if we think about bias, we can actually think about bias almost as like a special cases, like um, extreme cases of missing data, right? So all major forms of bias can kind of be thought of special cases of missing data where what we're interested in is this universe that is um, uh, this two by two by four table here. That's the universe that we showed originally, the, the target population. But what we observe is a subset of that, right? So the top row is selected. So we're only going to observe who we selected and we're only going to observe the mismeasured versions of those values. Anything that we didn't measure, like an unknown or unmeasured exposure or confounding variable is completely missing. And the actual true value of the exposure or outcome if that has mismeasurement is missing. And anyone who we didn't select into the population, into our study from the population is also missing. So we're seeing much less of the full picture than, we, than we're interested in. Um, and so EHR, as Nicole mentioned, EHR data is not collect is collected for clinical and billing purposes, not for research. And as a result, every data point that we observe in the EHR is subject to a unique selection mechanism. And this drills down to essentially two things: why the patient sought care, and then how the care was delivered. Uh, so knowledge of care delivery processes also, um, care seeking behaviors is really critical to, to understand the data we have in our EHR population. There's also this concept of missing data, which is different from research, the, our research concept of missing data, because in research, we think it's something that, you know, a data point that's not there is missing. But in the EHR, we're really talking about expected versus unexpected data. And so this spectrum of missing data can be somewhat useful to develop a framework of our assumptions about what is missing and what isn't missing. Is the data expected and observed? Like um, we expect that everyone has a race, everyone has an age, everyone has a sex, that's a thing that exists in everyone. And so um, if we observe it, it's non-missing. If it's expected and unobserved, then that's something that is really you know, black and white missing. Um, but is the data unexpected and unobserved. And an important point here is that most healthcare delivery is not really expected. When is healthcare delivery expected? Um, and so a lot of the things that we want to study in EHRs are somewhat unexpected and hard to know whether we would expect to observe them or not. And so when can you treat the absence of evidence as the evidence of absence? And one possible solution to this is to define the study sample as a group of patients for whom you would expect there to be data if they sought care for that particular problem. Uh, and so one example of this could be studying like the primary care base of a population. Um, and finally, a few more DAGs just to talk a little bit about missing data because we also have DAGs on missing data. And um, these DAGs show that uh, missingness where you're restricting to non-missing, which is R equals one. So notice that we're, um, for every node, we have an R equals one. We've put, I put brackets around that. That indicates that we've got a restriction there. And the answer to when a complete case analysis results in bias lies not necessarily in the information structure, but in the causal structure. And this is work uh, that comes from also the causal inference literature and it was formalized here in this paper. Um, for medical statistics by Daniel et al. And so if the missingness is unrelated to both our exposure or our outcome, we wouldn't expect there to be bias. And this is kind of the classic missing completely at random case. If the missingness is related only to our exposure, 
um, then even if we might have missing not at random, we wouldn't expect bias. But if the missingness is related to our outcome, and in my opinion, this is the, gonna be the most common in EHRs because we're studying primarily disease outcomes, then you can get bias. And even if it's an MAR or a, a missing not at random uh, situation. Um, and so now I'm gonna move to sort of the applied component of my talk. Um, I. Uh, I'm talking today about doing linkages between electronic health records and cancer registries. And the reason we do this is because in an EHR population, I'm a, a by the way, I'm a cancer epidemiologist. Um, and so that's why I'm interested in cancer. And so, um, you know, cancer is not an easy thing to tease out of the EHR. It's much more difficult than diabetes, for example. Um, you might know that someone had cancer, but you might not know exactly what kind of cancer, what the definitive tumor characteristics of that cancer um, were, uh, and whether or not they received treatment, especially if they went to another healthcare system for that treatment. So we frequently rely on registry linkage to identify cancer patients in our EHRs, helps us to get a gold standard, one of the nicest gold standards out there um, for the diagnosis and treatment of uh, disease. We use this EHR linkages for a number of possible uh, purposes. One is to develop cohorts, so we can use the linkage to, de to definitively define our case and controls for studies. And also we can use it for quality improvement to um, the registry has nice, cleaned, curated data for all the cancer patients uh, in our entire catchment region. So one thing that we might do is to compare the EHR data quality to the, the registry data or compare our systems cancer patients with the rest of the catchment region. And that's kind of a preview of what I'm gonna talk about next. Um, so we did a system-wide linkage, which I delineate differently from a targeted linkage. A targeted linkage is where we're going to do a linkage between the healthcare system. I have the, the sunny Southern California healthcare system on the left and the statewide registry, which is California's filing cabinet of all cancer data. Um, targeted linkage would mean that I mine my EHR to find people who I think might have cancer and then send them over to the cancer registry and they would send me back confirmations. System-wide is where we're going to take all the details from the EHR and all the details from the cancer registry and smash them together and see sort of who comes out. Um, and so this is a way that we might generalize to the entire statewide population, our EHR population, because by determining who is in our registry or who's in our EHR and our registry will help versus not in um, our EHR and in the registry will help us understand what our cancer patients look like compared to the rest of the California cancer patients. So this study was um, the Sutter CCR linkage project and Sutter Health, I'm uh, affiliated with Sutter Health, which is the largest integrated healthcare delivery system in California. It serves 22 Northern California counties with about uh, 3 million or 4 million patients, uh, 10 million outpatient visits a year. It's quite mixed in terms of racial ethnic distribution. And it's also uh, got a healthy payer mix. So some HMO, some PPO, uh, and some Medicare, uh, Medicaid. It's been using uh, EHR by EPIC for a long time, since 2000. So a lot of rich longitudinal data. The CCR is the California Cancer Registry. It's been um, reporting data since 1988. And as I mentioned, it collects detailed tumor characteristics. It also geocodes patients' um, residences to better understand this spatial distribution of cancer in California. So the overall objective of the linkage was to develop this gold standard case identification for cohort studies using Sutter EHR data. Um, we did this system-wide linkage to identify three groups of people, Sutter patients who have cancer, Sutter patients who don't have cancer, we could consider to be our controls, and then non-Sutter cancer patients who live in the Sutter catchment region. And we did two studies. We did an internal validation study to evaluate our ability 
um, for to use the EHR alone to identify cancer cases, and then to compare the quality and completeness for cancer-related variables in the EHR, and an external validation study to compare cancer patients from the Sutter and non-Sutter facilities, and also to generalize the inferences that we made in the Sutter population to our target. This was the linkage. It was a big data initiative um, where we took everybody in the CCR, that was 3.3 million cancer or tumors, confirmed tumors, and everybody in the Sutter CCR, uh, 4.8 million um, lives, and linked them based on uh, personal identifiers. And this was a probabilistic linkage that resulted in three groups. So our Sutter cancer patients, our um, non-Sutter catchment region cancer patients, and then our group three, which was our Sutter non-cancer patients. So people who go to Sutter, but aren't, do not have, or have not had cancer. And so notice that group one and two are really our target population. They are all the cancer patients who live in the Sutter catchment region, those who were treated at Can Sutter and those who weren't. We subset this to a more manageable group of patients by looking at more recent diagnosis years, only four types of cancers, and the first primary tumor. And this left us with about 16,000 Sutter cancer patients and about 30,000 non-Sutter cancer patients. And so the internal validation study, the goal was, can we use the EHR to find cancer patients, and classify cancer-related variables. So here's the results of our internal validity study. Uh, of the 16,000 Sutter-matched cancer patients, we found that only 75% of them had evidence of cancer in their EHRs, while 25% didn't have evidence of cancer in the EHRs. And this second group would not have been identified as having cancer if we had done what I mentioned as that target linkage. Um, but when we looked into more detail about this 25%, we noticed that a lot of them, 23%, actually seem to have been Sutter patients before they got their cancer. So all their EHR encounters predated their cancer diagnosis, and we assumed that these patients likely migrated to another healthcare system before their cancer. The um, 2%, uh, let's see, 8% or 2% um, appeared to be missing cancer related information in their EHR. And, but a lot of them, uh, 1,300, had never had their a primary care provider assigned. And so we might not want to include them because their data might not be complete. Um, so the interpretation here is that somewhere between 2 and 10% of cancer patients are missed using EHRs alone or using a targeted linkage. The second objective of the internal validation was to compare the quality and completeness for cancer-related variables. And so here we see that the accuracy of understanding whether someone received chemotherapy, hormone therapy, or surgery differs depending on whether you look in the EHR, the CCR, or both. For the chemotherapy, we actually found more data in the CCR, um, or so, sorry, we found um, that 2.6% had more data in the HR, but 21% had more data in the CCR. Um, we did see, however, that the EHR helped to augment our information, especially about hormone therapy, which may or may not be tracked very well by the cancer registry. The second component of this is the external validation study, and this has two steps. The first was to compare our Sutter cancer patients to the catchment region cancer patients. And the second would be to generalize our Sutter patients to that, that population. And so we did this first just by comparing who were, we knew were Sutter patients to non-Sutter catchment patients. Uh, and we saw here that um, generally there's pretty good generalizability. We did see that um, we had more female breast than non-Sutter catchment cancer patients. We had slightly more 
non-Hispanic whites and our patient population were like higher socioeconomic status and more often insured by Medicare. And, um, and so this was, sorry, this is um, proportion ratios, which is one way to describe this data. Another way, which I like, is this what we call a love plot, which shows um, the standardized proportion differences comparing Sutter and non-Sutter. This is the same data from the previous slide. We're just showing you where the Sutter patients were more often uh, like uh, versus more the non-Sutter patients. Um, and so you can see here the exact same information. So we, we conclude that Sutter patients are more often female, non-Hispanic white, higher SES, Medicare insured, treated for breast cancer and less often Hispanic, Asian Pacific Islander, lower SES, privately insured or treated for prostate cancer compared to the catchment region. The second part of the um, study was to do uh, a generalizability analysis. And a generalizability analysis is um, where we might take what we measured in the study population to generalize it to the target population. We performed what's called inverse probability of selection weighting, where we generated a model that we assumed would be sufficient to describe our selection mechanism, where selection is either sampled into the study, or in this case, sampled a, a member of the Sutter system. Uh, and so inverse probability weights can be employed to estimate the effect in the target population from the sample population, assuming some fairly strong assumptions that the effect is identifiable in the study population. So that's that internal validity uh, requirement. And that the model that we've defined, which is um, we used a DAG to define is correct. And that we have an ignorable selection mechanism after adjusting for the variables that predict selection. So this was the model we created the exposure, and this is really just a toy example, the exposure and outcome relationship we looked at was the relationship between race, ethnicity, and cancer stage at diagnosis. We have some other variables that we thought might predict being a Sutter cancer patient, like socioeconomic status, marital status, and insurance status. And these were all from our first aim, where we found which variables were related to being a Sutter versus a non-Sutter patient. We also ad added some additional variables that would predict selection. And, and specifically, we looked at the proportion of Sutter versus non-Sutter cancer patients in a patient's county. We ran a logistic model for the conditional probability of selection, uh, including all two-way product terms, and then created inverse, stabilized inverse probability weights and compared the confounder adjusted outcome model estimates three ways. We looked at all patients, Sutter patients only, and then Sutter patients reweighted by this stabilized weight. One thing I want to point out here is that there is this arrow from late stage diagnosis to selection. We didn't think that this was very strong based on the data, um, but it, I think it's a fairly common thing that's occurring in especially EHR based data because a lot of people will choose a healthcare system based on the disease that they have. So they already know they have a diagnosis and then they decide to go to a healthcare system. So I think even though it wasn't very strong in our example, this may be a very important arrow to consider um, for EHR based analyses where you're selecting on a particular EHR. So these are the results. Um, on the left column, we see the odds ratios for all patients of the relationship between race, ethnicity and later stage at diagnosis. And then on the right, we see the Sutter only patients unweighted to the left and then reweighted using our generalizability analysis. And you can see here that the Sutter population was fairly generalizable. But when Sutter estimates deviated, our reweighting strategy was helpful to recover our target population estimate. And um, one other thing here is that the bias was not very strong. So we do need more examples with stronger bias. So in conclusion, um, I think anyway that epidemiologic and causal inference theory, especially DAGs and understanding the data generating mechanisms can help elucidate bias in EHR populations.
Also creative linkage, uh, creative use of linkages to population-based data sources may provide an opportunity to perform validation and generalizability analyses like I've showed you today. Uh, EHRs from a single healthcare system might have limited external validity because the patients are non-randomly sampled. In fact, they're really just a, uh, a convenience sample from the catchment region. Um, ours was a very large <laughs> convenience sample, and so it was generalizable. But the generalizability analysis might improve confidence in policy decisions made from research that are conducted on a single EHR system. And so um, I wanna just wanna thank you for listening to my talk today. I wanna to acknowledge funding from the National Institutes of Health, both from the Center for Translational Research, as well as um, the cancer, National Cancer Institute, and my collaborators at Sutter Health, Palo Alto Medical Foundation, University of California, San Francisco, um, the Greater Bay Area Cancer Registry, and San Diego State University. And, um, my contact here is here below. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so before we um, kind of start with posing questions uh, to Drs. Weisskopf and Thompson, I wanted to introduce our panel participants. Um, I'm gonna actually let them introduce themselves um, and then we can um, kind of pose some questions and have a discussion around this very important topic. Um, so Dr. Coe, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Abel Coe. I'm a professor of medicine uh, and I do internal medicine and informatics and I direct the Center for Health Information Partnerships and the Institute for Augmented Intelligence in Medicine. Thanks. Great. Uh, Dr. Rasmussen Torvik. Hi, I'm Laura Rasmussen Torvik. I'm an associate professor of epidemiology in the preventive medicine department here at Northwestern. Okay. And Dr. Walunas. Hi, I'm Tracy Wallace. I am an assistant professor of medicine, um, an immunologist, an informaticist, and an enthusiastic uh, consumer of this data. Um, so, and also associate director for the Center for Health Information Partnership. Great. Um, so, I'm going to pose a couple questions that came up in the Q and A, and I hope that um, anyone can kind of chime in because they're pretty broad questions. But the first one was uh, about. Um, best practices in EHR record management and how to kind of bring attention to improving the um, uh, data quality, I guess, that was identified and some issues in that data quality. Um, so I think the, uh, the attendee uh, mentioned a national board or, you know, having the VA particularly focus their attention on this type of, does anyone have any thoughts about how to draw attention and improve the quality in the EHR records? Um, I mean, I'd be happy to speak to that a little bit. So, you know, it's a really good point. Um, when there is some kind of effort that exists to really ensure the quality of a certain concept, we do see that, of course, the quality is better. I don't know if you noticed, but when I was showing the results of those different quality measures, the one for tobacco assessment and cessation therapy is really, really good. Not just the performance is good, but the similarities between the three data sources is very good. And that's partially because it's a federally mandated concept. It is recorded very reliably. The problem with using that kind of approach is that there is already this incredibly heavy documentation burden on providers. They spend a huge amount of time documenting in the chart already, and we don't really want to add to that. So other opportunities for improving data quality, one is interoperability of EHR systems. So, you know, one of the things that both Caroline and I spoke about was this fact that somebody who sees um, an internal PCP versus an external PCP is going to have different quality data. If there's true interoperability between the EHRs, that problem would largely go away. It's a really hard problem, but it's something a lot of people are working on. Um, I also do see some potential opportunity for more patient involvement in uh, kind of maintaining their own health data. Uh, but that would have to be done very thoughtfully um, and with a lot of work. But definitely, you know, the findings that I have from the patient survey made me lean in that direction. I'd, I'd, oh, I'd like to jump in and say, too, I think that we need to focus on what we can do in the EHR. But I think there are some issues that can never be addressed in the EHR, particularly with the way they're built now for billing. Um, but I do think, you know, I really want to commend Amy. This, this presentation kind of came out of a, a 
a panel at AMIA, I think AMIA has been really focused on this issue. I think actually the epidemiology community has been less focused on this issue. And, you know, I think epidemiology as a discipline needs to really put a lot of these really great theories we have to work thinking about better ways to use EHR, the, you know, the quality of the data that we have right now. Yeah. Hey, a big plug for epi uh, by informatics. I think the combination of those two, you get people that love data building things and then people that actually are sensible about using it. So I, I couldn't emphasize that more. The only thing I would add too is that the NIH is actually, we all get funded by NIH. The NIH is really interested in this topic. Uh, so on Friday, we were in an advisory panel to the director talking about use of AI machine learning methods to improve the usability of EHR data. And there's a whole like, discussion about this topic. And the, the expectation is the report will come out and there will be some funding opportunities that will come out that will relate to this topic. So, so it's definitely of, of, of strong interest. Uh, Abel, I saw you nodding along with the uh, patients playing a role in the data quality um, and uh, thinking about how that could happen. Do you have any thoughts about how that could go forward? Yeah, you know, um, one thing to keep in mind with EHR data, even the very basics, I think people mentioned this, like uh, people's self-identity is a constantly shifting target. And the best person to answer that very first question about who you are is the person. And so one of the problems we oftentimes have is that in EHRs, we have answers and not questions, and we fail to take into account who's asking the question and what are the questions they're asking. Well, I think for at least for the very core things like who are you, what's your gender identity, your race, that, that's not going to get solved by, by us with, on the EHR. It's going to be solved by engaging the person who's, you know, who knows themselves best. Yeah, um, uh, along those lines, there was a question about the social determinants of health, which came up both in uh, Nicole and Carolyn's talks um, in slightly different ways, right? Um, one about documentation, which we just spoke about, but also one in terms of generalizability and the the patients who actually make it into the healthcare system. So I was wondering what your thoughts were and how well we do at really um, understanding uh, or having the HR systems represent the population we're trying to actually address. And maybe that's for Carolyn, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's an open, these are lots of open-ended questions. I think it's a really important one. I mean, I do think there, you know, the one of the ways we're using that the linkage that I went through today is to do some cohort studies, epidemiologic cohort studies to understand risk factors for cancers in smaller groups. And we've used pooling of electronic health records across multiple healthcare systems to try to maximize the, um, the ability to in make inference in smaller groups. Mm -hmm. And so that is also you know, a possibility, it takes a lot of effort, money, time, patience, ethics reviews, et cetera, et cetera. But it can be done. And like in epidemiologic studies where we're pooling data across multiple cohort and case control studies, I think maybe the future might be to try to get groups of researchers or and or healthcare systems, although they're not as interested in, in combining their data with other um, competitor healthcare systems. So researchers can often work as intermediaries to um, to combine the data. So we have two in progress. I'm not the PI, I'm just a collaborator on, but um, with, the, with the dream team at UCSF, two in progress studies looking at pooling across multiple EHRs with linkages to their re respective statewide systems. And the generalizability aspect of that analysis is even more interesting because we're start to thinking, you know, across state lines, across country lines. Mm -hmm. Um, Teresa, I was I just, just going to make a plug. Yeah, <laughs> I just want to make a plug um, uh, and, and, and speak a little bit out of turn for Capricorn, but the Chicago area Patient Centered Outcomes Research Network is one of my favorite ways to consider solving that problem because I think a lot about finding rare patients, particularly patients with autoimmune disease. And it can often, so frankly, your sample size can be small at any given institution, and the biases in who comes to that institution can be huge for certain patient populations. So Capricorn is wonderful because using a common data model, they've sort of, and, 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 and an incredible number of legal agreements <laughs> that are probably added to Abel's age and, and gray hair, um, have like, have essentially um, brought, uh, I think it's 11 now and soon to be 
uh, two uh, organizations in Wisconsin and Indiana, um, but it more or less covers all the major health systems in the Chicago metro area. So it, it doesn't solve all the problems of who gets care, but it's starting to reduce some of the missingness issues that come up. And what's also really cool is we have safety net organizations in that, in that, in that, like the Alliance Chicago that 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 works with 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 safety net uh, community health centers. And that also is another group of patients that's historically often not represented. I think all we're missing is small practices um, in many ways. I think Narina might be frozen. I don't know. Oh, okay, sorry question. about that. Um, uh, my apologies. I think we're at the top of the hour. So I wanted to thank our speakers and all of our panelists. And um, we really appreciate your time. And this is an exciting area. We're um, going to see a lot of, I think, new uh, studies coming out and new I think she was going to say opportunities. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just going to fill in the blank. <laughs> I'm just going to. I'm going to end on a positive note. <laughs> well, at least stay to the end. My apologies. Yes, opportunities. Thank you all. Before I lose you guys again, um, but take care, and we appreciate you joining the IFAM seminar. <laughs> Thank you, Nori. Thank you. All right, guys. Bye. Bye. -bye.